This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Camario, professor of the Graduate School in the College of Environmental Design and chair of the Hitchcock Professorship Committee. We are pleased, along with the Graduate Council, to present Lucy Jones, this year's speaker in the Charles M. and Martha Hitchcock Lecture Series. Dr. Lucy Jones has served as a seismologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and a visiting research associate at the Seismological Laboratory at Caltech since 1983. She created a um, safe app science applications for risk reduction, safer project to innovate and protect safety, security, and economic well-being of the nation. One of the major projects of this is a shakeout earthquake scenario and a sort of public emergency preparedness event that began with 5 million people in Southern California in 2008 and has expanded to more than 24 million people around the world. Now, let me tell you, Lucy got up at 5.30 this morning and was out there on the shakeout that took place today. Yeah, so she was in Oakland um, helping with the Office of Emergency Services. She's a real trooper with this. Uh, and these efforts have earned Lucy the nickname, the Earthquake Lady. She has sometimes been thought of as the earthquake mother because she had to talk to news reporters on camera while holding one of her children. She is trusted and beloved, not just because she's a reassuring mom, although that may be part of it, but because she knows how to explain complicated science to the public. In 2007, I was part of a multi-year, seven-year research project with a, with a large team headquartered, led here at Berkeley by Professor Jack Maley, who's here today, um, looking at the um, risk reduction in older concrete buildings. We chose the city of Los Angeles as a case study, and we did extensive data collection on the inventory of buildings that were part of our engineering analysis of building performance and part of our loss modeling. This work became background data when, in 2014, Lucy Jones was asked to serve on a special assignment by the mayor of Los Angeles, um, a science advisory seismic safety committee, uh, applying the results of the shakeout scenario and are using some of our research in the background um, to the, look at the city's older concrete buildings. Uh, the planning water backup systems, the fire department, building solar powered wireless networks, um, a series of things. And the, the wonderful news about this amazing year that she spent building a coalition of uh, different political groups in the city of Los Angeles was that on October 9th, just last week, um, Lucy celebrated a triumphant moment as the legislation was passed and required mandatory earthquake retrofits on 15,000 buildings in Los Angeles. Um, as researchers, we were in tears. We were so happy. Um, we can't tell you how important this is and how much it meant. Um, but before I tell you about her superb training, let me tell you about a, a story about women in science. Although her father, an engineer, encouraged her interest in math and science, her high school guidance counselor said, you shouldn't show you're good at math because boys won't like you. Even when she earned a perfect score on the science aptitude test, the counselor assumed that she cheated and made her take the exam again while the counselor watched. Of course, she had a perfect score again. Dr. Jones received a Bachelor of Arts degree in Chinese language and literature, magna cum laude, from Brown University in 1976. At Brown, she also studied physics and began to gravitate towards geophysics. Needless to say, she was the only woman in physics. In 1981, she earned her PhD in geophysics from MIT. She is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, 
member of the Resilient America Roundtable of the National Academy of Science, and previously served on the California Seismic Safety Commission. She has received numerous awards, including Meritorious Service Award from the Department of Interior and the Ambassador Award from the American Geophysical Union for outstanding contributions to policy and public service. In early October, very recently, she was awarded the Samuel J. Heyman Service to America Medal in Citizen Services, often referred to as the Oscars of government service. The SAMIs recognize federal workers who have made a notable impact in the United States and around the world. Despite being a woman in a male-dominated field, Jones has never asked for special treatment because of her gender. She never needed to. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy Jones to Berkeley. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> well, with that introduction, I think I'm going to have to acknowledge that, in fact, I think that there are times where the gender has uh, actually helped me, especially in these public roles, because um, you know, a lot of, if you ever have wondered why you come and talk to a seismologist after an earthquake anyway, why do you care about which fault it is? It doesn't help you rebuild your building. In fact, I sort of, we give it a name, we give it a number, we give it a fault, we make it sound more understandable, less frightening, and I think people always feel better when mommy tells them it's okay uh, than when daddy does. So when a woman scientist gets up there, we seem to be remembered more than the men when they do exactly the same thing. Um, this talk is a bit of an experiment. I haven't given a, a, a preliminary version of this anywhere, so you get to be my, my test subjects. What I want to do is to actually take the, what happened in Los Angeles over the last year and a half and uh, the really pretty extraordinary experience of trying to work that closely with elected officials uh, as a scientist and what insight I've been able to gain about the nature of the interaction and why we so often seem to be talking past each other and try and take from that um, some lessons for all of us as scientists about what we, ways in which we could do a more effective job of communicating. Um, Mary already told you quite a bit about this. Um, of course, in Southern California, as up here, the scientists have been doing a lot of work to understand the nature of the risk. Uh, back in 2007 into 2008, we created the shakeout scenario. We all, you know, you probably all went through the shakeout drill. Um, that was created to help people understand the uh, scientific model that we had already created. So we had hundreds of experts trying to go with the, the cutting edge science from basic geology through seismology, engineering, and the social sciences to get a comprehensive picture of what the big earthquake would be like. And the drill was actually created to help people understand it. And that's been out there and we've been talking about it, but it hadn't you know, there's only some traction that it's gained. Uh, a lot of emergency managers used it for response, but we weren't seeing people picking it up as a way of understanding how they could change the outcome. You know, that we weren't trying to do it to say how bad it's going to be. We were saying, you know, we were trying to say how bad it could be and why don't we not get there. Uh, so, you know, we've been hoping to get more traction on, um, on how to use the information to, to stop the losses. And then, uh, in a large part, actually, because of the, the peer study and the concrete, well, it was only a mix of it. Because of what's been going on in San Francisco, we went and approached the mayor of Los Angeles. We wanted to tell him about the CAPS project in San Francisco, which has been a decade-long effort since the anniversary of the 1906 earthquake, the centennial, uh, to really try and bring people together. We wanted to get something similar going in Los Angeles. And we had the, the meeting set up, and the Los Angeles Times ran a big article about the um, uh, concrete buildings and the whole peer study that came out two days before the meeting, which had been already set for a couple of months. Uh, it did affect the nature of the discussions. We had a little more uh, focus on what we were trying to talk about. And uh, so the mayor was very interested. And, um, 
A, a big piece of this, I have to say, is really Mayor Garcetti having the intelligence to understand the issues and the confidence to take them on. Uh, we've had previous elected officials with one or the other, and you really need to have them both in place uh, to get action on a difficult project like this. Um, what we ended up negotiating was me actually spending the year at City Hall. Um, which is about as different a place from Caltech as any place I can imagine. Um, I've spent my whole career on campus at Caltech, where I think even more than this institution, I don't have to worry about somebody trying to look at me, let alone try to talk to me. And uh, to go down to City Hall and then have people talking to me all the time was a, a, an interesting experience. Um, but I'd like to take this and look at some of uh, what happened through here and how I came to understand it and, and where it took us. Just uh, remind you that you know, we, we set these goals, looking at what all the earthquake issues are. We wanted to protect the lives of our citizens. We wanted to improve our ability to respond and make sure we were ready for recovery. Well, these have been our goals for a long time, right? That hadn't changed. What's changed is how we've been able to respond to it. And, and here's a, um, a quick list of what the mayor's plan is. So it's extremely comprehensive, addressing multiple areas of problems with the, um, uh, the built environment, particularly older buildings, uh, and the mandatory retrofit of software story, concrete, and excessive damage. Buildings that are badly damaged in an earthquake have to be strengthened and not just repaired. Um, uh, those are the ones that were wrapped up into one ordinance that passed last Friday, a really big deal. Um, we, the voluntary rating system, it's voluntary, it doesn't require inspection. Both of these have already been in place. Most of these other items are, are underway and getting started. So it's been a, it's a huge project, it's comprehensive, and it's um, more than I thought I was going to get going into City Hall. So why? What did we do differently this time? What I want to do is start with some sort of basic things of thinking about what the scientific process is and how that compares with the way the rest of the world works. I don't know how many of you watch the what is it, XKCD cartoons, um, you know, the difference between normal people and scientists, you know, um, the question of uh, uh, with the science, we don't think that, cause, that coincidence is automatically causality. And in fact, I think you can put this, that scientists actively reject stories. Stories give you the wrong answer, right? You go through this situation and who knows whether or not it was really connected to that. You have to test it over and over again. The scientific process is the process of making sure you are not misled by a story, that you go to your statistics and you work out the, you know, all of the details. And in fact, I, I, I'm going to do this to people. How many of you are scientists in the room? OK, the, the, the strong, definitely the majority of what we're looking here. So um, you have a pretty good idea of how the scientific method works, and it's not what your kid tends to get taught in fourth grade, right? Um, you tend to notice something that happens. You actually wonder whether it's a coincidence or coincidental, and you, you go and set up tests for it. You come up with a model that you think would explain that pattern that's actually consistent with the rest of the physics that you do. You make predictions from the model, and you test the predictions. Only after all of this do you present it to your colleagues, and you make sure you explain all of this along the way, and your colleagues then go and rip you to shreds, right? This is a core piece also of the scientific process. That's the point of peer review. It's to keep you from fooling yourself. You may have thought you avoided that story that misled you. Your colleagues have the job of making sure of that. And this affects quite a bit about how we go about communicating with each other. Because as colleagues, our job is to attack our colleagues. It is to find the weaknesses in the argument. And we get taught this in grad school. So we never, ever give the answer first. Right? You know you're going to be pulled apart by your colleagues if you've given the answer already. Before you say what your result is, you make sure you explain the full background, how you laid out the experiment, 
all of the uncertainties that you considered, and only then do you give the result, because otherwise your colleagues are going to get that result and immediately jump to ideas of why it's wrong. So you don't communicate that way. You always start with the previous information and work your way down and give the result as the last thing. This is classically the opposite of the way most of the rest of the world operates, and especially journalists. When you read a newspaper article, they start with the result, then they give you a bit of why this matters. And only when you get down to the bottom of the, the article, for the few people who make it all the way through, do they give you that background information to set the context. So when we go and communicate this way, We've got half of the people listening to us who have stopped listening before we ever get to the result. Right? This is, I think, really, in a sense, you've, you've got the core issue, I think, in how our communications have tend to fall apart is right in here. And there's a lot of other things that fall out of it. Um, if we go ahead and, and look it out in a bit more detail, all right, there's so many different ways in which, in which we differ between the way you handle scientific arguments or scientific expression and the way journalists do it, which is essentially the way most of the rest of the world does it. And part of this is writing. This was actually done up uh, as an uh, exposition on, on how differently uh, scientists and journalists write. But it really can also go into how we speak. And when we talk about our results, we're going to always give our evidence first. We're always going to talk about the uncertainties. We always try to make sure that there's a logical argument. And we think that people make their decisions on logical arguments, which also, in general, isn't true. Right? Um, another fundamental difference between scientists and the rest of the world is we live in uncertainty. Right? If it's already understood, it is no longer interesting. Nobody's doing research on things that are well understood. That's not what we want to talk about. It's not what we want to think about. We think about what we don't know. Right? But when we're looking at what it is that people need to have from us, they want to know what we do know, the part that we're no longer caring about. And again, when we talk about our results, we're going to make sure we explain what the uncertainties are, and people, non-scientists, often hear that as what we don't know. And in fact, uh, I'll get a little more detail on this later, but there's a, a very significant issue when we deal with earthquakes of how, how afraid people are of earthquakes that really is out of proportion to the risk that they pose. And when you look at what makes people afraid of things, uncertainty increases fear. Right? If, the, if somebody says, you know, we know exactly what could happen, that is less frightening to most people than not knowing what might come through. And so when we're communicating in crisis situations, it is a time when people particularly want certainty from us. Right? And it's very tempting to go and say we are certain. Well, there's, right, scientists will tell you all about the uncertainty and leave people upset because of that. The non-scientists tend to move to certainty even when it isn't there and say, don't worry, we've got this handled. And then if it turns out, in fact, that they were wrong, it actually becomes worse. Uh, and in fact, there have been some studies on how this handled. Uh, you're going to see some work. Uh, uh, Tim Selnow and Deanna Selnow, um, they were at the University of Kentucky. They just moved a month ago to the, the University of Florida and have done a lot of work in analyzing how uh, messages are perceived. They're, they're professors of risk communication. Uh, and show a couple of different examples when you look at the number of stories that are created. So what we've got here is versus time. Number of stories, the red's about swine flu, the uh, green is about vaccines, and the blue is about shortages of the vaccine. So early on, people were saying, don't worry, we've got the vaccine, it's coming. When in fact it didn't come, then there was a whole nother set of stories that developed about the shortages and got people much more distressed about this because they had been proved wrong. 
uh, similar sort of data from uh, media coverage. I don't know if you remember when there was uh, salmonella uh, in peanut paste. And peanut paste turns out to be put into all sorts of different manufactured foods. Originally, they denied that it was there, or denied that there was a relationship. When more information came out later, you get this whole other surge of extremely negative stories because of the fact of being proved wrong. And it's just to say that the uncertainty we talk about causes distress. Turning it into certainty, if you aren't going to be able to pull it off, turns out to have um, a whole other suite of problems. If we go back to some of the more fundamentals about science communication, there's a lot of ways in which we can use this thought about certainty versus uncertainty in how we describe it. So especially on the earthquake side, people are often asking us if we can predict earthquakes which we can't, right? There's nothing that's different about the beginning of a, a six than a three, and so it's nothing, you know, what the threes are happening all the time, so we, we, we don't see any changes because the six is coming. But, you know, people asked us that question, and, and us literal-minded scientists try to answer the question we're asked. That's also one of the mistakes that we tend to make. Just as a general rule, answer the question they should have asked instead of the one they asked, and you're often going to be a lot better off. And if you ever listen to a politician, you realize that they never get bothered by the idea of answering a different question than they were asked. Um, I, and when you look at what happens with earthquakes, you see this a lot. Because people ask us when the next one's coming, we can't answer it. We've created a whole series of probability maps expressing the probability that we would be having this. We tend to do a lot of miscommunication through this method. We are always choosing 30 years to express it. I don't know if you know that we do 30 years because it's the length of most people's mortgages and therefore a time frame on which they're making um, financial decisions. And we were asked to use 30 years, so we faithfully come along and use 30 years. And I would say probably half of the population hearing this thinks we know something about 30 years and that that's the reason that we chose it. All right? uh, so in general, I'm not sure how much good we've done with this because there's a lot of misinterpretation that comes through. Uh, and we also have the issue that the places that don't have the really high probabilities say, oh, I'm OK. Uh, I don't have a figure of this. The classic one is San Diego, right? They look at the red around Los Angeles and San Francisco, and they're only yellow to orange. Hey, we're good. We don't have the problem that they do. Any other state in the union, they'd be the most dangerous city there was, right? So again, what are we communicating as we do this, as we focus on the probabilities, we tend to increase the feeling of uncertainty. And what we're ignoring then is the fact that, in fact, we know exactly what's going to be happening in the earthquake. We just don't know when. So by turning to scenarios, well, so this is a scenario that we're working on right now to get a, a much more detailed picture of what we expect to happen on, on the Hayward Fault. We're calling it the Haywired scenario because we're looking at the impact on the digital economy uh, as, as well as then fr from the, the basic science of it. By focusing on this, yeah, we don't know when it is, but we can tell you what's going to be happening. And we have a lot of details and a lot of certainty. And by going to scenarios, we have been able to focus on what we know rather than on what we don't know. We increase the feeling of certainty. There's an acceptance that we don't know the time, but we're able to focus on the fact that you know, time's not predicted. A lot of other things are, and a lot of other things that can be useful. Um, Another significant issue in, this, in these differences is really how we treat conflict and consensus. Right? To a journalist, the story is in the conflict, just like to a playwright. They look for where there's disagreement, and that's where you hear, you hear the story. So most journalists coming in and they hear an argument between two people, they think that's significant, and in politics it is. Of course, in science, argument's what we do every day, right? That is the scientific process, where one person has a model and the other person's trying to break it down. And the process by which we find truth is the conflict. So when we have a story is when we have consensus. When you've got everybody agreeing and we stop being interested in it, that's when you actually have your scientific results. So. Um, the, and again, here's another problem. Once it's settled and we've moved on, 
that's really when we need to make sure that it's being communicated to the decision makers. So just the whole scientific process does not encourage us to communicate focused on the, the complete certainties. It tends to get us to focus on the uncertainties, which is what we want to do anyway. A, a, another difference I think that's significant in this is that the work in science is in details. All right? You might eventually be able to pull everything back to a big unifying theory, but to prove that something's true, you need to get down into the tiniest details, be able to isolate one factor from all others, and be able to prove what that one factor does with it, without the uh, you know, confusion of the other factors. So in most sciences, we do our work deep down in the weeds. We are really focused on separating it out. And that also is going to be how we tend to talk with each other. Because to our colleagues, again, it's where the interest is. But in general, those details are not what a policymaker needs to go and make decisions about this. So it's one more place where I see as, as our, our cultural differences get in the way of the communication. So if we sort of sum it up, what, what the scientists are doing, we're rejecting source, stories, we're spending most of our time dealing with uncertainties and details about the uncertainties, and we expect to be arguing with each other all the time. Right? That's just that's what our process is. So by comparison, what goes on with an average person? Um, you know, Richard Feynman had the classic uh, scientist uh, address to it. If, if they can understand it, it must not be worth doing. So there, there is this aspect of it that we don't find any incentive to make our, our work understandable to the more general person. But compared to what the scientists want, they do respond to stories. Those are very important in making emotional connections. They want to know what's known. They don't want to know what we don't know. They, don't, they want to hear, uh, actually, I, they want to hear that there isn't conflict. I miswrote that, right? Uh, they want to know what's the consensus rather than the conflict. And they want the big picture. They want to understand how it matters to them. So we have some very fundamental differences in here. And a lot of them are tied around emotional issues. Right? Decision making is much more emotional than most scientists would like to know that it is. You can make the logical argument, and they will use the logical argument, but people need to feel how they connect to that story to want to take any action on it. So then we need to get into a lot of the ideas around how people perceive their risks and respond to it. And again, there's some really interesting research that's been put together in, in social sciences about how people look at risk and how they, it affects their decision making. And uh, the sort of quite literally writing the book on it, the book is called The Perception of Risk, is by Paul Slovak. He's a psychologist out of the University of Oregon, and much of the field is developed out of, uh, from work from him and his students. Um, but they've been able to identify several things that really increase fear in how people respond to emotional messages. Um, one of the biggest ones is the involuntary. Uh, we are quite happy to choose things that are risky. We drive on the freeway all the time, and it's one of the most dangerous things we do. But we have the illusion that we're in control, because we're holding the steering wheel, and we've chosen to do it. So we are much more upset about risks that are imposed on us than when they come out of um, uh, things that we chose to do. And earthquakes are sort of the ultimate out of control experience and generate a lot of this. We're also more afraid of things that have the potential for affecting the whole society. Potentially catastrophic increases our feeling of it being dangerous. Um, an interesting one is they call it the dreadedness of the outcome. If it's a really awful death, it's somehow much worse to us than a death that wouldn't be that painful, right? If we really wanted to make our lives safer, we'd shut down McDonald's, right? We would be trying to deal with uh, the uh, heart disease that we're facing. But the idea of being trapped in a downed building and then the fire comes through, I mean, that's about as awful as you can think of. And again, so we, um, uh, earthquakes hit a lot of those buttons. Um, the other thing is the idea 
that it is invisible, unpredictable, and unknown to science. They all sort of tie together. Um, it increases that feeling that we aren't in control of things. And to the public, science looks, it, it looks like we don't understand earthquakes, partly because we get this focus on when they're going to happen, which is the one part we really can't do. Right? Uh, it's also, though, that we don't do a very good job of communicating what we understand. And I see this as a fundamental, uh, back to that answering the question they should have asked idea. The reporter comes in, the earthquake happens, they say, what, they, you know, they're faced with the scientist. My God, how do I get this guy talking? All right, what did you learn in this earthquake? Because that's a good way to get a scientist to get talking, right? The scientist takes it literally. They want to know what I learned in this earthquake, so they tell them what we didn't know about the earthquake instead of replying, actually, this was really predictable damage. We got the, you know, the buildings we thought were going to come down came down, right? That's not the answer you give to what did you learn in this earthquake. So we tend to give messages that we don't understand them. And there's a very strong perception in the public that the damage is quixotic and we don't know where it's going to happen. There's another issue that has a pretty strong impact on how people uh, perceive our information. And it's what's called numeracy. Uh, it's, you know, it's like literacy people who can understand numbers. And so there's one fundamental issue that there are a chunk of people who, are, who don't really understand numbers. They are not necessarily stupid people. There are some very bright people that are considered less numerate. And uh, highly numerate individuals do do a better job of handling probabilities. Uh, you will often see in this situation an overthinking. Well, I mean, come on, come on, 10% in 30 years? I think I'm fine, you know. You can overanalyze some of the numbers. Um, but you also see that the emotional impacts have a much higher uh, effect on the people with low numeracy. And it's something, you know, the, there's actually been quite a bit of research on how people handle this. And it's not an obvious thing. As I said, it's not being stupid. But there is a significant percentage of the population that does not process numbers the way we think about it. We also have discovered that even when even highly numerate people um, can uh, misinterpret they don't use the probabilities when strong emotions are involved. And so even the people who think they're being very logical, we will see with strong emotions that there are um, uh, extreme reactions to something that would really be a very low probability risk. But if it's got a strong emotion attached to it, that doesn't really go through. Um, and I just had to add this other one, because I find this really odd, that even highly numerate people respond differently to what's called relative frequency instead of to probabilities. If you say something has a 1 in 10 chance of happening, people see it as being more likely than when you say 10%. Even people who understand numbers, there is an emotional reaction. They think it's tied to when you say 1 in 10, you're focusing on that 1. You're focusing especially on things that have a bad outcome. Whereas a 10% chance is sort of a focusing on it not happening. Uh, and it, it applies to, across the board however much uh, uh, education you've got and however what level of numeracy you got. Um, we always see more compelling responses when you use frequencies, it, which actually changed some of my behavior. Because I sort of recognized not everybody got it. And I used to say, well, you know, there's a 5% chance that this will be a foreshock. That means that it's a 1 in 20 chance, you know, 95% chance that it won't happen. And I would tend to give them all of these different numbers, some of them with relative frequency and some with probabilities. And that was probably a really bad way of doing it. Because people hear them differently enough, it ends up confusing the messages. OK, let me go back then and say, if we've got these sort of differences, how are we trying to bridge the gaps? Right? And I think there's, there's a couple of ways in which we've gone about doing this. One is recognizing that our scientific belief that logic is how people make decisions needs, we just need to accept that that's not true in a lot of people. And especially in the elected environment, 
They need to be responding to the emotions of their constituents. And that, the value-based judgment is how it is going to be happening. And what, if you want to you know, convince an elected official to take an action, you don't do it by giving him numbers and giving him the logic. What you need to do is being help them being able to see how this action or decision affects their world. And one of the things that I've done within the USGS over the last decade is leading a program to develop uh, scenarios of a various um, natural disasters. We began with the shakeout scenario uh, here, but we've also done ones of storms, we've done ones with, with tsunamis. As I said, we're moving up here now into the Hayward Fault one. Um, and these scenarios serve a couple of functions. One of them is focusing on what we know as opposed to what we don't know, really being able to concentrate on the impact rather than the uncertainty about what the time is. The other thing we're doing, though, is we're making a story. And I didn't realize it at the time, but as I look back, I'm realizing the incredible um, importance of that approach, that a scenario is essentially a scientifically defensible story. And in fact, that scientifically defensible part is by far the hardest. You know, when we make one scenario, we're picking one plausible outcome, and the scientists tend to look at it and go, but why'd you make this assumption? Why'd you make that assumption? Don't you think that this could be what's happening? Don't you think we should be doing this probabilistically? And we have to say, you know, this isn't trying to express the true range of risk. This is being plausible, helping people understand how the disaster fits in their world and their decisions. And we have to accept that when we make a scenario, we are not going to be getting that earthquake. You know, I, when we, you know, so many assumptions went into creating shakeout. That will not be the earthquake that happens. We are trying to say this is a plausible earthquake. It's the type of thing that we need to be planning for. But giving them that story lets them see how it affects the role. And one of the things we did in this process was move closer to storytelling than I ever would have imagined before we got into it. And in fact, what I'm going to show next, um, this is actually, we took all of the scientific analysis for the shakeout scenario and we turned it not just into a story, but a movie. We are working in Southern California around the corner uh, from Hollywood. It's a sunny morning in Southern California. Across the region, 7.5 million people are busy at work. Several hundred thousand of them are commuting to jobs in different counties, far from where they live. Over 200,000 commuters work and reside on opposite sides of the San Andreas Fault. Today, these families and many others across the region will be separated. Eighteen hundred people will die. 53,000 people will be injured, and $213 billion in damage will occur. It's 10 a.m. The largest earthquake to hit Southern California in modern times has just begun. Some people react appropriately, others don't. In the intense shaking, nearly 1,500 buildings collapse. Infrastructure is severely compromised and 300,000 buildings suffer significant damage. The rupture travels 200 miles northwest along the San Andreas Fault. Violent shaking lasting as long as two minutes in some areas. Finally, the earthquake is over. Many of the lifelines of Southern California have been disrupted. A large number of people are trapped in collapsed buildings. Over 1,600 fires start, some turning into super conflagrations. Millions of people are trying to use their phones, causing the system to become overloaded. In the months ahead, there will be tens of thousands of aftershocks. Residents will struggle to recover from the earthquake. There will be no water for weeks or months, and no electricity. Traveling from point to point within the city will be extremely difficult. 
and 255,000 people will be displaced from their homes. We are all in this together. We will suffer the consequences if we don't do our part right now. How quickly life gets back to normal after this disaster is up to you and those around you. Your level of personal preparedness will determine your quality of life after the quake. It's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher, a first aid kit, and enough water for each person in your household to have at least one gallon of water a day for three days. Have an emergency plan. Decide now where you will meet your family after an earthquake. Make sure there's a person out of town you can contact to let your loved ones know that you're okay. Homeowners should be sure to bolt their house to its foundation. Consider whether earthquake insurance makes sense for you as part of your financial plan. Even if you're not a homeowner, you can secure your personal possessions against earthquake damage. Preparedness is not only for the home, but also for business. Be sure that your company has emergency plans for a major earthquake. Empower yourself and your family. Be prepared. Uh, so, uh, not the usual way in which we usually publish our scientific results. Um, it, it has, however, gotten a, a million hits on YouTube. And it's gotten our message out much farther than any other thing that we could have done. Um, I'm getting close to wrapping up. I want to spend a moment, it is shakeout day, to look at some of the other communication messages we got out of the process of creating ShakeOut and which ones of them work. So we had a few different explicit tactics that we developed as we were creating ShakeOut. We talked with the social scientists and we came up with certain objectives as, as we went and put the, the pieces together. Uh, let me just go through them. Uh, consistent messaging Mm, is, is a big piece of this. Uh, it, when people hear the same message from multiple sources, it is more reassuring. It increases that feeling of certainty than when you get different people saying different things. That greatly reduces the level of certainty. So we made the decision of all of the different earthquake you know, safety proponents that we would settle on the same message, we would focus on drop, cover, hold on, and that we would, and then plus take one more step, do one other thing. And we went out through multiple media. We bought, uh, some of us bought uh, uh, advertising, had a, a lot of different ways in which we went about it. And we shared the messaging and made sure that it was consistent, creating something called the Earthquake Country Alliance. Uh, in Southern California, it's now been uh, working out more nationwide. Another big piece of it is apparently is visual reinforcement. People are more likely to do what they see other people doing. This is one of the reasons we focused on the drill, because how do you see people preparing for an earthquake? That's a pretty abstract sort of thing. Whereas looking like an idiot under a table and trying to not have your butt sticking out, you know, I've done this too many years, uh, it's a very defined visual. And it says, oh, these people are thinking about earthquakes. So we are. Um, that is part of it, but it's, it's, it's a generalized picture, not just the drill itself, uh, that you were taking this on. Um, so drop, cover, hold on. We actually got all of this um, graphics that were donated during the process and keeping that going. We also focused on making this the biggest, you know, a big media event. How do we get that visual image? We were trying, you know, we explicitly took on things like the Quake Cottage and things that were visual to get it to show up on TV to try and encourage that visual process. Um, another aspect is that people only come to the decision to do something by talking about it with people they care about. This is apparently a pretty important piece. It is very rare for somebody to just go, oh, OK, I understand this risk. I'm going to do this. They usually need to take a process that gets them from the acceptance to the action. And being able to talk about it makes a big difference. Um, in the drill, what we did is focusing on trying to have um, the drill happen in in all of the different entities at the same time. The reason we're doing this is to encourage people to talk about it so that the kid comes home from school and says, Mommy, I had an earthquake drill today. And Mommy's like, oh, I had one at work today, too. And Daddy's, yeah, so did I. And maybe you get some family discussion going. Um, 
at a different level, this is really the process that happened by me moving into City Hall. One of the reasons that it happened where I think it hasn't in a more, you know, with, without such close collaboration is because you needed to sit and talk about it and make it seem real and, and make it part of the discussion to get it to happen. Right? But then I think one of the other really important things that they said is that we shouldn't be just presenting the problem. And this is one of the core issues, and I think it's going to, it plays into a lot of other scientific communication, that we as scientists are only comfortable talking about the things that we do, right? I'm an expert on seismology. I need to be talking about that and not about the engineering issues. And especially, even if I'm willing to pretend I'm an engineer, uh, or at least talk about what my engineering colleagues have done, the policy part really feels like it belongs to someone else. But it's been really clear that when you present the problem without a solution, you don't encourage action, you encourage anxiety. And in fact, some more work from the Salnows, they uh, expressed it as this, they called it the idea model, that internalization, explanation, and action all have to be part of any crisis communication. Um, and that if you don't have all three pieces, you, you often make it actually worse and less likely that people will take action. Um, they did a lot of different studies. I decided I'd just throw this up here and say, yes, there's numbers behind uh, all of this as they tested various groups of people. But what you get down to is if you only tell people what they should do and the science of it, but you don't tell them how it relates to them and why they individually should care about it, you generate indifference. If you convince them that it matters to them and you tell them why, what's going on, but you don't tell them what to do about it, they actually test out with diminished knowledge and confidence and less likely to take action. Um, you have to put all three of them together to actually see an increase in action and, and working towards these things. So what does this have to do with climate change? You've obviously, this isn't really a talk about climate change, is it? I'm sorry if you fought, got uh, teased in here on that and, and we aren't getting to it. Um, you know, but I, my experience is out of that earthquake process and I feel like I'm coming up with results and, but let's think about it, how, how it applies to what, um, the, the, what is going on in climate change. And I think there's two big pieces, and you've heard me saying it over and over again today. One is our focus on uncertainty. When we're talking about this, we all know it's happening. What we are, are, what we are interested in as science, as scientists, is the details. How much of it is human-induced? Exactly where are the models working out? What exactly is gonna be the result for California? How much extra rain are we gonna get? We focus on all the things that we don't have the answer to. The absolutely basic, you could do it in a high school lab, that when you put heat and you have extra carbon dioxide, you trap more heat, and you take out the carbon dioxide, you trap less heat. It's so simple, we don't talk about it. And yet that absolute basic and being certain is the message that people need to hear. Right? And we tend to, th all right, but wait a minute, we just told them that all the scientists agree, and I'm, where the hell did this number 97% of scientists come from? I, I, sometimes I really wonder who those other 3% are. Um, but uh, that's telling people, you aren't smart enough to make your own mind. You need to believe it because all the right people tell you to. Right? And I, I think this ties back to a pretty fundamental um, aspect of how we treat science education. We educate people in science to find the future scientists. Go listen to the discussion. We need to have more STEM education because look at all those STEM careers. We never say everybody needs to be able to be a science researcher. And I don't mean understand science facts, right? And I, I, we sort of treat science the way People in the Middle Ages treated reading. Reading was for a specialist. You didn't need to do it yourself. 
right? If you needed somebody to read or write for you, you went and got a scribe to do it for you. Even the kings didn't write. You got your information by hearing what the priest was telling you in the pulpit. But with the advent of the printing press, we started really changing that. And within, you know, not that long, after the advent of the printing press, you needed to be able to read yourself to participate in the social discourse. You could still get a job, but you weren't really part of society. And we're treating science the same way we used to treat reading. If you need to get a scientific analysis done, get a specialist to do it for you. And you know, most of us in this room have made jobs out of that and made careers out of doing that, and we don't really expect others to be doing it as well. But I would suggest that in the internet era, that the whole digital revolution is changing societal need for scientific analysis, that with the removal of the constraints of the cost of print and ink, absolutely any information gets published and is accessible to everyone. We no longer have an editor telling us what's fit to print, what you should be listening to. Absolutely everything, including the complete nonsense, is out there available to people. And individuals now need to make their own decisions about what information is worth listening to. That is the scientific skill. That's what scientific analysis is, how to look at data and understand its significance and, and understand the implications of it. And really to handle the flood of information in the internet era, everyone needs some level of scientific analysis. And if people in general had those skills, we wouldn't be having this discussion about climate change. We wouldn't be saying, believe it because all the scientists believe it. It would be so blazingly obvious. So I think that's one big aspect that we really need to, to take a hard look as scientists about how we are educating others and how do we take these skills and not restrict them solely to the people who are gonna become our clones, but really recognize it's a skill that everybody needs. The second issue that I think we're facing with climate change is that we have done the classic thing of we've told people what the problem is without giving them a solution. When scientists get up there and talk about climate change, we talk about all the things that are going wrong, and you gotta deal with it. And most people, I've actually started sort of checking this out with people, and I, we should probably do a more statistical analysis of this. I am astonished how many intelligent people who accept climate change, your general Californian, um, believes that the only way to deal with it is giving up our current life, right? It seems like the solution is gotta be, we've gotta give up fuels, you know, fossil fuels. Doesn't that mean we have to give up our computer? How are we gonna manage to have the life we want? And we really don't wanna give up the life we want. So we move back from thinking about it. Yeah, it's happening, but I guess we'll have to adapt or I guess it's not, I don't want to think it's happening because I don't want to deal with the consequences. And I would suggest if we want to get action on climate change, we need to give people something concrete and positive to do. Um, when I look at it, I tie it actually to the rather fundamental issue that oil is finite. You know, there's various versions of this model that show oil production versus time and how it's expected to go. And as we have, you know, the, the, the graph shifts at times. When we started fracking, we got a lot more uh, versions of oil. We have deep water drilling that's able to go on. Um, you know, as we make explorations, we've been able to delay the running out of fossil fuels. But that does not mean we won't run out of fossil fuels any more than avoiding an accident somehow makes you immortal, right? There is still only so much oil out there. And at some point, and whether it's 2050 or 2100 or sometime, we will be out of oil. And when that happens, we will either no longer have energy or we will have renewable energy. And I'm pretty sure, we're pretty smart people, we will have renewable energy. So that's where we're going to be eventually. And the only question is how much social disruption and how much ecologic disruption we take to get there. So there's a really clear, obvious answer to what we do about climate change. And that's we invest a whole lot of money in renewable resources because whoever develops the really efficient renewable energy 
they're going to be ruling the world when we get to this world without oil. Why don't we want that to be us? And we could take that message and combine it with climate change and say, there's your solution, and it's good for the long-term health of our country. Let's take positive action and move in that direction. And I think, you know, the, why I was successful in LA was not, it was having a clear story of what the problem was and tied it to a solution. You take these actions and you are protecting our city. We need to do the same thing with climate change. And you know, people don't want a world that falls apart. They don't want it so badly that if we don't give them a solution, they need to believe that it isn't going to end up there. And to be able to believe it, they need to see the path forward. So thank you. I wonder how much of your talk we could also summarize by the words visual imagination. You mentioned that scientists think one way, journalists think the other way. But in my experience, every scientist I've ever known thinks visually. And when I read newspapers, it's very clear that the journalists are verbal thinkers. And there's a big, big di difference. You mentioned numeracy. And again, everyone I know th th thinks of numbers or visualizes numbers in a sort of visual way. But yet those who m w call themselves not so numerate or whatever one uses are actually usually people who do not think visually. And then you also mentioned the process of science education where we select those who will be future scientists. Basically, our science education right now is selecting those who think visually and excluding other, words, other people. And I think you also pointed to an ideal world in which the general public is kind of scientifically literate. And I would venture that that ideal world you describe is actually where everybody is somewhat visually imaginative, that everybody still has the same visual imagination that they had when they were five years old before they learned to read. Yeah, and, and, and you pointed out Gutenberg and how Gutenberg changed the world and changed okay. reading from being something that only a select few did to something that most people could do. And I would say using visual imagination might be the equivalent of your Gutenberg, that if we get everybody to use visual imagination, then what we call scientific thinking would not be the world of just a select few. I, I would agree that all of these things, I think, would help. And I do think visualization is part of it. Um, I do think the storytelling part is one of the biggest things that can be visual. But we know as scientists we have to reject it. And yet the users, we could really use more light than this. Uh, the, <laughs> the users uh, uh, need the stories for the emotional connection. Yeah. Uh, so in stories, we might set up a hero's journey, and pretty quickly we're going to get into good guys and bad guys. Is that going to work for in a case like this? Do we need to talk about good guys and bad guys? I don't think we should be talking about good guys and bad guys, and I think that that's actually been one of the problems, and where it's just going, here's a solution that makes a difference, and you tie a, a concrete solution and an action you can take, it's going to be a lot easier to acknowledge it and move forward. Hi, uh, great talk. I was really, the, the last thing you talked about was the action, and you gave a very big example that right. we can change our entire system. But I'm wondering if it wouldn't be at least as effective to give people like maybe even solutions that as a person who really cares about global warming, you feel like, oh my god, this is pathetic. But if your goal is to get someone to begin to believe the science, then like, planting a tree in their yard might actually help them believe global warming science? I think you have to have some connection already made to get, I mean, I don't think that it's wrong to go for those small actions, giving people individual things that they can do. But, and I think one of the problems with climate change is it's so large. It is a hard thing to make that connection. So, um, you know, it's, none of the solutions are, you know, ex Absolute, let's put it that way. You know, we need to, but I think that these ideas that you tie solutions to the problem, you give actions, it, it, it makes it easier to process the information. And you can say, we've got these bigger ones and we can take these smaller actions along the way. Mm -hmm. 
At the risk of being uh, disdained for this, I, I honestly do want to know about educating scientists, because as a science writer now, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I have worked with scientists most of my life. And when I have individually talked to small groups of um, often PhDs and, and former academics who are now in the private sector, um, I'm not credible to them until I tell them about my science training. And then all of a sudden, OK, you're OK. You're a geologist. That's good. No, I'm not. I was a mediocre geologist. I'm a superb writer. You know, right. I know that. And so what I have done with small groups um, is talk to them about, you know, because I was in marketing eventually, how we perceive information. And I mentioned each time five traits of very highly trained scientific minds versus some of the negatives in terms of marketing for the highly trained uh, scientific minds. You know, the fact that you go to negatives first and you're presenting that to others. After that, I asked every single one of the listeners to please write down all the positives and all the negatives. Not one person remembered all the positives. Almost all of them remembered all the negatives. I think that has to do with their critical thinking skills, because they are going to the negatives first. They don't understand the filters. So my concern is about mutual respect. I want to. I want to bring that to both parts, both the fear well, that people won't understand the scientists, well, and scientists are disdaining well, I think others. That that's sort of what I'm trying I'm to say is that the um, uh, the training of scientists, what's needed to do the science of rejecting the stories, of being critical of each other are processes that we have to do as scientists. And what I'm asking is that I think we need to acknowledge that those can't, that's not the way the rest of the world thinks, and it can get in the way of our communication. So not give it up, because we have to do it as scientists, or we aren't going to get the right answer. But we need to recognize that it is not the way much of the rest of the world communicates, and we need to take, take that into account when we're trying to do it, and not say other people are wrong for not doing it that way. Right. And, but I think helping everyone understand the nature of peer review and critical data analysis is going to help as well. So this is fascinating. Thank you for talking about, I think, the difference in the way that scientists and uh, normal folks, as it were, communicate <laughs> is relatively large. I, I come out of the religious community, and especially I think the way we think about the way that global warming gets tied up with narratives around creation, especially for like conservative or evangelical Christians. Mm -hmm. And so my, my question is just kind of, that their worldview and their approach to ecology is so embedded in a particular narrative about the way the world works. And is there, do you know if there's any um, work that's being done around that? Or how can we communicate with folks whose entire like story that they tell about reality differs so drastically? Well, yeah, I can't solve everything. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I would just say that that uh, uh, it's a temptation that we need to avoid to think that that is the definition of religious. I would rather say that that is the definition of a very small subset. Right. And um, uh, if you've got people who insist that there is no data and that the world is 6,000 years old and that's it, and anything that says otherwise is God testing you, that's a, that's a logically consistent model that's in, incompatible with well, what it is we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that you know, there's, there's a whole lot of other range. And I will say, I'll, I'll, I'll end on a controversial note, how about I do that, is that um, one other difference between scientists and journalists, scientists believe in reality. Our science is an attempt to model reality. We always know we don't have it right. Right? Every new science advances disproving something else, and we know that eventually our models are going to be supplanted. So eventually, so we know we're wrong, but we are trying to do the best possible job, and we know there is right and wrong, and there is something real. And, and I will say that the, that's part of the religious worldview, too, is that there is reality different ways of understanding and, and different parts of reality that perhaps aren't reflected in the data in the physical world. 
but they believe that there is truth. To a journalist, there's often not truth. There's always the other side of the story. And they don't accept the concept that, that something can just be right. And I think that's another time that when you always have to find the other side of the story, instead of saying, actually, this is just true, it, or even to accept the concept that something can be true, um, is a challenge. And I think that in sometimes there are bigger differences between scientists and journalists than between scientists and people of faith. So on that note, thank you.